served. And now you're telling me we're not supposed to climb the ladder? We're supposed to descend the ladder? This doesn't make sense. And I'm sure that's how the early church responded, his followers responded, because Jesus, what he said was countercultural then, and it's countercultural now. We, we, gra- we don't think that there's a, a pathway to greatness by being a servant. We think that's a starting point, and then you leave that and you pursue something else. But see, when we recognize why Jesus came, Jesus didn't come to reveal what the world says and what the world's ways are. We already figured that out our own. Jesus came to reveal God's ways and what God has to say about our lives. And so when Jesus says this, we realize this is important value to him. So therefore, it's important value to the church. And not only did Jesus teach this, he modeled it with his life. He gave up everything. He emptied his life. He he took on a servant's attitude and gave up everything so that you and I could experience the life that he wants for us. And see, that's why it's a value in the church, because he told us it was. And that's why it's our fourth core value here at Impact. It's serving. And because our value statement here is saved people serve people. And I want to unpack this value statement because I think it's important for our understanding of why serving is such a great value. Uh, Again, this word saved in scripture, it's a Greek word. It's sozo. And the word sozo, although it's translated saved many times, it can actually mean to be delivered, rescued, or healed. So the idea is that Jesus saves us in life. So therefore, he rescues us from the effects of sin in our life. He delivers us from the evil that has affected our life. He heals us from the effects of sin in this world. Jesus saves us because he rescues, delivers, and heals us in life. And when we realize Jesus saved us, what we'll naturally aspire and want to do is to help others experience the same thing. You know, I was thinking about this. I was thinking, imagine you were on a cruise ship going to the Bahamas, right? And the cruise ship hit an iceberg, right? Right? I don't know what an iceberg is doing on the way to Bahamas, but let's just go with this one, right? So you hit this iceberg and your, your cruise ship sinks, right? And so there you are on the open seas, right? And a scary place to be, right? Open seas. And here comes a lifeboat. And that lifeboat's there to save you, to rescue you, to deliver you, deliver you from the open seas, right? And so what do you do? It's like, I'm in. <laughs> Here's my hand. Help me in, right? And you get into the lifeboat. And the moment you're in that lifeboat, you don't say, whew, good, I made it. Hope everybody else does. No, there's this moment when you get into that boat and you look at it, everybody else on the open seas and you naturally put yourself in the posture to help someone be saved, to reach a hand out, to be saved in this lifeboat that you are now in. And see, that's the understanding. Saved people, they serve people. Because we recognize that God saved us, rescued us, delivered us, healed us. And we so want that for anybody else who was in a position like us prior to knowing Jesus. And see, this is what we see in the early church as well. The early church realized that God had saved them, rescued them, delivered them, healed them. And naturally, they took this posture of a servant because of what Jesus said. And they looked at their society and they instantly, first movements of the church that we see, they began to serve their community put themselves in a posture where they desire to make the community better. And we see these these things that birthed out of the church, began to serve the needs of the community, distribution of food, helping those who were overlooked in society, the the widows and the orphans. And it was a big problem then because in that culture, the Roman government society, they would say to the men, hey, you become a soldier in the Roman government, we'll take care of you. We'll give you a pension. Your life will be great if you help us advance. But then guys would say, oh, okay, sounds good to me. See you, hon. See you, kids. I got to go be a soldier. And they would die on the battlefield. And guess what the Roman government would do about the widow and orphans? Nothing. Forget about them. So the church saw this huge overlooked segment of society and they instantly began to create food programs, welfare programs, healthcare systems, education systems to help and serve those who were lost in the open seas of life. And immediately we start to see the life change that began to happen. In fact, many of the services that we see our government provide for the world today were birthed out of the church. And, and when we look at how the government's running things, not going too well. <laughs> see, God wants the church to be the movement of his love and grace into this world. He wants the church to be those that, that come alongside and, and rescue and save and deliver and heal. This is what he's all about. And so in the early church, we story after story of how serving others delivered, rescued, healed, saved people from the realities of this world. That was a movement of church. And so much so that in Acts, we read a few times where this statement that because the church postured itself to serve and to love others, 
many people, it says, and God added to their number daily those who were being saved. God regularly rescued, saved, delivered, healed people because the church postured itself as servants to serve those, put themselves before others. It's the pattern that has allowed the church to have great influence in this world today. That's why it's such important value in the church because the moment the church loses this value, the church loses its influence in the world. The moment the church forgets about and loses the value of serving, it loses its influence in the world. And I don't know if you've been paying attention, but the church is losing its influence in the world. This is not the way it's supposed to be. And, and we, we can't change much, but you and I, we can change who we are as a church. We can change who you and I are and the value that we have. And, and, and again, I think when we start to do this, the chain begins right here. And not only do we experience the benefits here as a church, and others do, but God wants us to know that when you and I serve, you experience a benefit too. In fact, you experience a blessing. A blessing comes out of serving others. See, serving others allows us, there's three things that I think we learn from Jesus in the church. The first one on your outline there is serving others allows us to experience God's power and see his miracles. When we serve, we realize God's power. See, the church was never meant to be a spectator sport. <laughs> the church was never meant for us to sit on the sidelines and watch what God's doing and go, yeah, it was awesome, great play, good job. No, God calls us and invites us into the field of play where we experience the rush and the adrenaline of what he's doing. We experience his power. And when we experience his power, we start to see what he's doing. And we see the life change that happens. And that's what miracles are. It's when we realize and God reveals his goodness in someone's life. And, and there's miracles that happen all the time. If we were just to pause and, and focus on life change that happens, uh, on someone who makes a choice no longer to do one thing and do another because of God's power, that's a miracle. I mean, there's so many miracles that happen in this world. We miss them sometimes because we, we, we're not part of the serving and seeing them. In fact, Paul himself, one of the writers of the early church, he wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus. It's known as Ephesians. And he, in the middle of his letter, he talked about the value of loving others and serving them. And then after he talks about that, he launches into this prayer because he so wants people to know this power. He so wants people to see the miracles that he's seen himself. And look what he says as he wraps up his prayer in Ephesians 3.20. Now to him, God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within who? Us, the church. See, what Paul's saying is that Man, when we understand serving and loving others and putting others before ourselves, because God can do things beyond our imagination. God will do things that we can't imagine, immeasurable in our understanding of things. And he says he does it all because of the power that's worked within us, his church. God can do great miracles when we do that. In fact, it's so awesome when it comes to God doing miracles because they happen all the time. And in fact, the first miracle that Jesus performed is found in the Gospel of John chapter 2. And if you're familiar with the story, Jesus shows up at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Now he's there with his disciples and his mom because it must have been a relative or a close friend or someone who lived in the town with him. And so he's at this wedding and this wedding's going on and, and they, the, the, whoever planned the wedding, they messed up because the story says that they ran out of wine, right? And that's a big boo-boo. You don't do that, right? It's like you don't run out of something. And, and, and weddings are hard to pull off. Believe me, I know. We're planning my daughters in another month and a half and they're expensive. I don't want to run out of anything. In fact, the one thing I'm going to run out of is money and that's, that's going to happen, right? It's like, uh, but, but, but it's one of those things that when it happened, it's a reflection of those who put that wedding on. And so Mary noticed this and doesn't tell anybody, but she walks up to Jesus because Jesus, she knows he can do something, right? And she says, Jesus, you need to take care of this. You're like, you know, you've got a lot of connections. Call someone who knows a wine distributor or something, you know, get them over here, right? And that's probably what Mary's thinking because it's the first miracle. But yet Jesus realizes what he can do and he decides to do it. And so what does he do? He gets the attentions of the servants at the wedding. He says, hey, 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 guys and girls, come over here. I need you to help. And he says, there's these six jars over here, these jars for ceremonial cleansing. And he says, I want you to fill them up. And it's about 120 gallons uh, uh, that he, they needed to fill up. So we don't know how long it took. But he says, I want you to fill them up. And then once they're filled, I want you to take a cup, dip it out, and then take it back to the master of ceremony and give it to him. And then watch what happens. So the servants say, okay. So they fill it up. And again, we don't know how long it took. But they, once they got it filled, they took a soup out. They walked it over to the master of ceremony. They handed it to him. And the master of ceremony takes the cup, sips it. And he's like, oh my gosh, this is the best wine I've ever tasted in my life. He goes, this is amazing. In fact, he was so amazed and stunned because he said, and he actually says it. He goes, usually the host serves the good wine first and the second wine bat later because no one notices then. He says, but you did the opposite. You served the best for last. 
And so, it was so funny, when you read that story, the master ceremony had no idea a miracle happened. The guests at the wedding had no idea a miracle happened. Who knew a miracle happened? The servants. Those who postured themselves in a way, said, God, whatever you want me to do, we'll do it. Even if it doesn't make sense, we're just going to do it. And they were the ones who saw the miracle because they were the ones who experienced God's power. And see, this is the reality. When we posture ourselves as a servant for God's behalf, we start to experience his power through our life. And we see the miracles that he can do, the life change that happens. And they'll happen all the time when we're part of that. And then the next thing I think the blessing that comes from serving is serving allows you to discover your personal value and increases your potential in life. See, serving allows you to experience something that you've never noticed before a value that you have that you didn't realize it was there. And then when you realize that value, you see yourself differently. You have a new potential as you realize God's using you with his power. And the reason that this happens is that the Bible tells us that the moment you chose to do life with Jesus, the moment you said, I'm tired of the life my way, and God, I realize you did something on the cross for me so that I could pursue your way, and I want that. The Bible says the moment we make that decision, his very spirit indwells our lives, our hearts. And his spirit brings something along with it. It's called a gift. And a gift is a divine ability that we didn't realize before or notice before or have before, but God supercharged it, empowers it to allow us to do things that we couldn't do without his help. It's called a gift. In fact, Paul, and he wrote to another church in Corinth, it's known as Corinthians, he, he tells us this when it comes to the idea of gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 following, it says, there are different kinds of gifts but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service or serving, but the same Lord. And there are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. See, he's saying that God gives us these gifts, these abilities, and that when we use them, God allows us to experience his power and we begin to see his miracles, his working in the world. In fact, maybe I threw you with the idea of gift. and now It's known as a spiritual gift. I don't know if you've ever heard that before or have you ever taken a spiritual gift assessment or spiritual gifts test, but I would encourage you to get one of these. They're on the information counter. If you've never taken a spiritual gifts test, and hey, real quick, good thing about this test, you can't fail. <laughs> it's impossible to fail this test, right? It's, it's simply something that tells you and helps you identify the way that God has gifted you and the things that he's done in your life that he wants you to use for his purposes. And so I encourage you to do this. Take it probably about 15, 20 minutes. There's some d definitions of gifts in there. It'll really be helpful for you to understand your value and see the potential that you have. And then once we recognize that gift, God says you got to use them. Look at four, 1 Peter 4.10. He says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's, what's the word? Grace in its various forms. See, God wants everyone to know about his goodness. Everyone to know about his mercy everyone to know his grace, that, that his kindness that allows us to see who he is and what he wants for us. And when we use our gifts, these divine attributes, this divine reality that God has given us, then other people can see that. In fact, God has given everyone a gift. No one will have all the gifts, but you will have a gift. And God knows how he's wired you. And so you'll have a very specific gift that he wants you to use in a very specific way. And I don't know about you, but when I give a gift to someone, I am more than excited when they open that gift up and they're excited and they see it and they rip it out and they try it on, they test it out, they wear it out. Oh man, I, I love that as a gift giver because that means that I, I feel excited because I know they're excited about what they received. And, and the opposite's true, true as well. It's like if someone opens a gift, it's like, oh, oh, nice, thanks, and puts it aside, I'm like, oh, I'm disappointed because, yeah, you know, they, they didn't experience what I wanted. And I can imagine it's the same for God. God has given you a gift because he knows you, knows your wiring, knows what you're all about. And he wants to ignite that and impassion that and, and, and draw that out of you. And he wants you to have the joy that comes when you experience his power and you see his miracles because you took that gift and you said, I'm using it for your glory, God. That, that is just what, what he's saying and, and I love it. And it increases your personal value then because you realize you have something you didn't have before and you're using it in a way that, that's giving you excitement and passion. And, and, and you know, when it comes to God's word, I love God's word in so many ways. But one of the reasons why I love God's word so much is so often what God says will happen in his word, people discover the truth in other ways. Like for example, there was, there was a study done about those who serve by a secular study done in, uh, I forget who did it. But it was a secular study that was done and it determined that people who serve, people who volunteer, 
they're less likely to struggle from depression and lack self-confidence. They're more likely to be people who are energetic and confident in what they do. So the very things God's word says we're discovering. And God's like, I told you. It's like no big deal. No surprise to me, right? And see, this is the reality of serving. When we tap into our gifts, we build self-confidence, energy, and strength. We have a new value and we see our potential like never before. And then lastly, I think that serving allows us to experience real community that increases our effectiveness together as a church. You and I experience real community, the community that Ronnie talked about last week, the value that we have, that when we surround ourselves with people that are like-minded and have the same passions, something happens. We're part of something bigger than ourselves. We lean into that. It encourages us. It lifts us up. And then together, we become more effective as a church in what God wants us to do. You know, serving allows us to live out that value. And when people in the church begin to serve alongside each other, something amazing happens. We become identified as the body of Christ. In fact, Paul, in, later in his letter in, to Corinthians, he wrote, wrote about that the, the idea of the church is like a body when we're functioning right. And look at 1 Corinthians 12. He says, all these, meaning the efforts and work and gifts that we do, are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one as he determines. See, he, he, you don't get to pick your gift. God picks it for you because he knows how you're wired. And just as one body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. And see, so Paul's saying that just like a body has many parts and it all works together, and when everything's working together, that body's healthy and thriving, so so it is with the church and what God wants for us, what Jesus wants for us. He says, when we're all doing our part, we're thriving and active and healthy, and, and we know that when your body's healthy, man, you, you feel great. You accomplish things. Everything's going well. But if something part of your body isn't working right, you suffer. In fact, if whatever's not working right is vital, a vital part of who you are, you might be in danger of dying. And see, that this is why it's so important for the church to understand serving because every one of you in this room is vital to us being a healthy church. Everything that you do, the gifts that you have to offer, the way that you're wired, the passions that you have, God says you're vital for us to be the church that he wants us to be, to be the faithful church that will make a difference in this world. And it doesn't matter how you feel about yourself, God says, I have value in you and I want you to see that value. And there's nothing greater than when people work together, we experience God's power, and we begin to see the miracle of life change happening right before our eyes, and we see it and we celebrate together, and as a church, we're thriving, healthy, active in our world. In fact, Jesus probably the best way he personified this and exemplified this besides going to the cross was in John 13. In John 13, it tells the story of Jesus gathering for his last meal, the, the last supper. It's when he introduced to us what we do at communion by taking the, the wine and the juice and, or the bread and the juice and, and remembering what God did, Jesus did for us on the cross. And the Bible says that in John 13, it says that right before that meal, before it was served, Jesus got up from the table, dressed himself as a servant, took out some water in a bucket and a rag and went around and washed his closest followers' feet, his disciples' feet. And you can imagine the disciples reacted to this like, oh, geez, whoa, hey, no, don't do that. We should be doing this for you. What are you doing this to us for? And they were uncomfortable with it. But Jesus said this. He says, look, guys, he says, if you don't let me do this to you, then you don't understand what I'm all about. And if you don't understand what I'm all about, then you know how you have no part of what I want to do. It was a pretty serious statement. And so when Jesus said that, and after he did this, this is what he said in John 13, 17. He says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. He says, now that you know what to do, you will be blessed if you do them. And you think about that. Jesus wants to bless us by being servants. And so when we read these words, there's been churches that have literally taking buckets and rags and wash each other's feet. Maybe you've done that. I, I've done that and stuff. And yet, so right now we're going to have ushers come down and they're going to bring some buckets and rags and we're going to, no, I'm just joking. We're not going to do that. Because <laughs> I can imagine, I've seen my feet. They're nasty sometimes. I ain't washing your feet. There's no way I'm doing that, right? This is not going to happen today, right? And, and see, when we look at these words, the reason people have taken this literal is because Jesus said, do these things. But see, Jesus was doing something culturally relevant. It was a culturally relevant thing when you walked into someone's home as a guest that their servants would meet you out the door and wash your feet. 
and then let you then come into their home so it was like a, a moment of care and cleanliness for the home. It's much like when we take our shoes off the front door for someone's house. See, and then, so Jesus was talking about a culturally relevant thing. And so he's not saying that we have to literally wash people's feet. You can if you want, right? But what he's saying is we've got to be willing in this pursuit of life with God to lower ourselves to the lowest position to do whatever we can to serve others. Whatever we can to save other people by helping them be rescued, delivered, and healed from the very things that the world has caused them. And when we do that, Jesus says, you will be blessed. And see, I don't know about you, but I love the idea of blessing. See, blessing is called divine favor. And I love the word favor because when it comes to the idea of favor, I think of ice cream treats because they call them favors. <laughs> and so it's like the idea that, that God wants to give us ice cream every day of our life. God wants that feeling when you get ice cream, you know, you're, oh, I love ice cream, and you're excited. He says, this is what I want to do in your life every day. Every moment, I want to give you this favor that washes you with this excitement and joy and this feeling of satisfaction and goodness. This guy says, that's what I want to do. And look at it again. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. God wants to bless us. And so as we wrap this up, there's some, the big idea that I want to just throw out to us. This is simply this. If you value being the church and representing to the world who God is, then you will value serving. You will value the posture of being someone who says, I want to put other people before me. It's not about me. It's about other, reali other people realize who God is. You know, this last week I sent out an email to our staff and just asked them to identify some of the servants that are uh, in this place. And man, it was great to get those emails and to read through some of the people that are doing some things. And name after name, story after story of individuals who serve in children's ministry behind the scenes, who serve in student ministries, guest services in the cafe, greeting, ushering, up on the stage, you know, using their gifts. And just story after story was so cool. And so many names I knew, but ah, I didn't, which is great because it's not about me. It's about what Jesus is doing. And God's doing some great things here. In fact, then there was, there's stories of those who, who help with the, the community feeds and distribute food once a month on Thursdays and those who visit people in the hospital regularly, those who write letters to those in prison encouraging them in their plights. I mean, it's just amazing story after story of those who are influenced. In fact, I was going to mention a few names, but, but Brennan, in his list of like 25 names that he sent, he goes, hey, if you mention one, you've got to mention all. So it's Brennan's fault that I can't mention anybody, but uh, you can talk that up with him. But there's so many leaders here. And the reality is, is they serve regular and they serve awesome. Many of them serve every week. And the reason they serve every week is because there's needs every week. And the reason that they meet those needs every week is because there's not enough of us helping with those needs. So let me encourage you, if you value being the church and you value serving, to take out this piece of this page in your program, it's the Everyone Serves Initiative. We've done this before. And maybe you saw this and you said, oh, here we go again. And I get it, I get it. But the reality is, is God needs you. And God wants to bless you. The church needs you because God wants to bless the church. And so I look over these lists, children, students, guest services, great place to start. Simple, just greet, usher, help with the cafe behind the scenes, facilities and grounds. You know, we have needs around here. In fact, over the last almost two years, we had someone who owned a landscape company who took care of our grounds. So they've been beautiful, but he sold the company. And, and now we have needs there again. So maybe if you know how to start a lawnmower, we, we could talk to you because we're going to need that. Prayer, worship arts, your gifts to, on the uh, the uh, stage here, administrative, we have data entry, computer needs, outreach. You know how you're wired. You know where you're at. In fact, maybe you don't see a connect or a fit here. Let us know how you're wired. Still put your name and email and let us reach out to you and help work with you to, so that we could be the church that God wants us to be. If God is nudging you, don't resist it. Because once again, the church needs you. God doesn't. But God wants to bless you. And God wants to do his divine favor in your life. And he wants you to experience his power, to see his miracles, to be a part of what he's doing in this place. Because he wants his church to thrive. He wants his church to be faithful. He wants the church to change the world. And the greatest way we can change the world is through the influ influence of being servants. So let me encourage you to do that. Do you want to be great in this life? Do what Jesus says. And be, learn to be a servant. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Again, thank you for allowing us to be your church, to be your representatives in this world, to show the world how great you are. And so, Lord, we recognize that comes with incredible responsibility. And, Lord, I know our lives are busy, and I know there's things that we do, but, God, help us to see how we can help your cause by being a servant in your church. 
but putting ourselves in a position to help others, to serve so that together, God, we are a functioning body that's thriving and healthy and vibrant and being exactly who you want us to be so the world knows who you are. So God, help us to be your church. Thank you for this value. And as a church, may we be faithful to pursue it and apply it and to seek it out, to be all, everything you want us to be. So thanks, God. Allow us to do this in your name. In Jesus, we pray.